so good evening students so welcome to another session right so we have been talking up or we have been taking up a series of lectures on the topic called organic evolution so with regards to that in the previous session we started off with various theories which were implemented by or which were given by several scientists regarding the process of origin of life on the planet earth right so with regards to that we have seen we have just started off with the introduction part of the topic called as organic evolution right and along with that we have also started off with several theories with regards to the origin of life on the planet earth which was given by several scientists right so all of these theories what we have discussed or what we are being discussed are all said to be hypothetical theories so that's what i told you even in the previous session also so they are all said to be hypothetical theories because at that point of time no one were there when life originated based on certain experimental evidences which were available at that point of time scientists came up with their own theories with regards to the process of origin of life on the planet earth right so with regards to that we took up with a few theories which were given by several scientists right of which the first theory what we took up was the theory of special creation which was given by father sauls so in this theory he said that life originated because of some divine power right so because of some divine power the life on earth originated the second theory what we took up was the theory of panspermia or the theory of cosmozoa which was given by a scientist by name erginius so he said that right so what erginius proposed was right the entire uh, universe the life is being distributed right and from an unknown part of the universe some amount of protoplasm reached the earth and in the form of either sperms uh, sorry spores or germs so those spores or germs were actually called as panspermia and from there on life originated on the planet earth so that was the second theory what we took which was called as the theory of panspermia or the theory of cosmozoa the third theory what we took up is the theory of abiogenesis and as i have already said several scientists accepted this particular theory several several prominent scientists at that point of time so through this theory scientists believed that life originated spontaneously from non living organs so that's what we have seen in the third theory and the fourth theory what we saw was the disprovence or disproving the abiogenesis theory which was given by three scientists francisco redis palanzini as well as louis pasteur so they came up with the theory which is called as theory of biogenesis where they said that life originated from pre existing living organs right so we have seen a couple of experiments also which was done by these scientists to disprove the theory of abiogenesis and they said that if life has to form on the planet earth already existing living organisms are required so that was the fourth theory what we took up the fifth theory what we took up was the theory of catastrophism which was given by two scientists george cuvier as well as orbin so these scientists believe that believe that the life the earth experienced some sort of catastrophes which is nothing but uh, some sort of natural disasters so because of this natural disasters right so because of this natural disasters what had happened is the entire organisms that were present on the planet earth were completely destroyed and once they were destroyed new organisms with special features came in their place so that they called it as the theory of catastrophes and the last theory what we took up is the theory called as chemical evolution or the theory of organic evolution so i told you that this is the uh, theory which is most widely accepted by several scientists because of certain experimental proofs that is available for this particular theory so we'll be taking up that experiment also today right which was done by two scientists stanley miller as well as harold urey right so those two scientists they performed an experiment to show that the theory of chemical evolution or the theory of organic evolution is actually true right so this theory as we have already seen was given by two scientists again oparin as well as halley so what these scientists believe was believe was life originated spontaneously from non living matter or the inorganic matter right so from the inorganic matter as a result of certain chemical or rather uh, as a result of certain physical factors physical factors such as uh, lightning ultraviolet radiation volcanic eruptions etc it led to the formation of simple organic molecules from inorganic matter or from inorganic molecule so these organic molecules once they formed led to the formation of life on the earth so that was the theory which was given by oparin and halden 
in the theory of chemical evolution or the theory of organic evolution right so we have been talking about the chemical theory of evolution which was given by these scientists right so in this juncture in the previous session right we started discussing about the theory of chemical evolution so i told you that the theory of chemical evolution or rather the theory of organic evolution could be studied under two heads one is chemical evolution followed by biological evolution so in this uh, in this prospect right in the previous session we started discussing about the chemical evolution process so right how exactly chemical evolution took place or what exactly led to the formation of organic molecules so that was the one we started discussing in the previous session so just a quick recap of what we have seen in the previous session then we'll get into today's session which is called as the biological evolution right so as proposed by oparin and halden with regards to the theory of organic evolution or the theory of chemical evolution they said that life originated in two phases one is called the chemical evolution phase and the other one is called biological evolution phase so we took up with the first one which is chemical evolution phase so what did we see under that is whatever organic molecules are there are being trans sorry whatever inorganic molecules are there are being transformed into organic forms right so before we saw that we actually discussed how the universe was formed so almost 20 billion years ago the universe was formed that was the, that is what the scientists actually believed right we have also discussed a few things about the big bang theory right so what they said is before the universe was formed the entire space was void empty and it was very very hot as a result of which there was a massive explosion in the space and that massive explosion was called as the big bang as a result of big bang billions and billions of galaxies have been formed so each galaxy again had several stars in them they have several planets they had the uh, gases clouds of gases as well as dust present so in such so many billions of galaxies one such galaxy was the milky way galaxy where the earth was formed and we also saw that earth was formed approximately 4.5 billion years ago so we also discussed about what was the condition of the earth right the primitive earth or the primordial earth when the earth was first formed i told you i gave you a list of few things right the conditions of primitive earth what we also call it as the primordial earth so what was the conditions of the primitive earth when the earth was first formed number one the temperature was very very high right there was very high temperature second one several lighter elements were formed in the form of or, or were present in the form of gases gases like ammonia gases like methane gases like helium hydrogen and water vapor was also present at that point of time and the third one what did we see at that point of time free molecular oxygen was not available right since molecular oxygen was not available the atmosphere at that point of time was a reducing atmosphere and not an oxidizing atmosphere why it was a reducing atmosphere because there was no free oxygen available at that point of time oxygen was present but it was seen in the form of water vapor right so it was a reducing atmosphere third one first one was the temperature was very high second one what did we say the second one all lighter elements were present in the form of gases right the third one and i gave you the list of gases also the third one is since no free molecular oxygen was available at that point of time right the type of atmosphere was a reducing atmosphere and not an oxidizing atmosphere and number four what we saw was the energy source at that point of time was lightning as well as ultraviolet radiation and number five what we saw was there were torrential rains present at that point of time so if it rains for a long period of time rather a very long period of time almost years together we start calling it as torrential rains so because of this torrential rains it led to the formation of water bodies such as oceans so these were the conditions of the primordial earth or the primitive earth when the earth was first formed right now what these people believe is oparin and halden believe this believe this in the presence of this physical factors such as lightning or ultraviolet radiation whatever gases are present in the atmosphere those gases underwent some sort of chemical reaction right leading to the formation of simple organic molecules right simple organic molecules such as amino acids were formed right simple organic molecules such as the simple sugars were formed fatty acids were formed the nucleotides also were formed right 
So all of these substances, that is the simple organic molecules, were formed in the ocean bodies, that is in the water bodies, or it was formed in the ocean. Therefore, Haldane started calling the ocean, having these organic molecules as prebiotic soup, or he also called it as the hot dilute soup. So the, in this hot dilute soup again, right, all of these simple organic molecules led to the formation of complex organic molecules, right? So first RNA was formed from the RNA, DNA was formed from the DNA, again, proteins were formed. So the central dogma of molecular biology was seen at that point of time, right? So this we started calling it as the process of chemical evolution, where the organic molecule or rather the inorganic molecules were transformed into simple organic forms, later on the complex organic forms. This is what we have seen in the, this is what we started discussing in the previous session. So once the organic molecules were formed, it led to the formation of protobiomes. This was the intermediate phase I told you, right? In between the chemical evolution as well as the biological evolution, there was an intermediate phase that was present. And that intermediate phase, we start calling it, we started calling it as the formation of protobiomes, right? So these organic molecules, they all combined together, they aggregated together to form aggregates of molecules. So these aggregates are actually termed as protobiomes. So we saw about two different types of protobiomes in the previous session. One was called coacervates and the other one was called the microspheres, right? So from these uh, protobionts, from these protobionts, life originated. That's what the scientists believe, right? So we'll now get into the next phase, which is called as the biological phase, right? Or the biological evolution. So we have discussed about chemical evolution. We have discussed about formation of protobionts and we have seen how the protobionts were also formed. And now let us discuss about the third, second phase, which is called the biological evolution phase, right? So what happens in this biological evolution phase? So the third phase or the second phase, what we have is biological evolution. So we have discussed about chemical evolution, right? After chemical evolution, we saw about formation of protobionts. Then the next thing what we are going to discuss now is the formation of uh, bio or the formation of life forms, which is nothing but the biological evolution, right? So scientists believe that, as we have already discussed, scientists believe that universe originated almost 20 billion years ago, right? Then they also believe that Earth formed, right? The planet Earth formed almost 4.5 billion years ago. Similarly, scientists believe that the life forms, the life forms first appeared almost 4 billion years ago, right? So the first life form which appeared on the planet Earth was formed approximately 4 billion years ago, right? So that is what we have. So let's start discussing about this biological evolution, right? So once the protobionts were formed, right, that is uh, the co or the microspheres were formed, these co or microspheres, they underwent some sort of modifications, right? These co or microspheres, they underwent some sort of modifications. And those modifications led to the formation of life on the planet Earth. So the first group of organisms, what we'll be taking up, right? The first group of organisms, what we'll actually be taking up is called as anaerobic heterotrophs, right? They are referred to as anaerobic heterotrophs. So what are these anaerobic heterotrophs, right? So some of these uh, co acervates or microspheres, right? So some of the co acervates or microspheres, which were actually for these protobionts, right? They underwent some sort of modifications. They underwent modifications in such a way that, right? They underwent modifications in such a way that these protobionts were able to produce their energy or they were able to gain their energy by undergoing a process called as fermentation. They underwent a process called as fermentation. I hope all are familiar with fermentation, right? So fermentation is one of the uh, respiration process which occurs usually in the absence of oxygen, right? So whenever there is absence of oxygen, the process of respiration usually occurs through this process called as fermentation, 
right? So there are different types of fermentation, alcoholic fermentation as well as lactic acid fermentation. All that we have already discussed in a few sessions before, right? So we are not getting into the details of that. So these organisms, right? Some of the protobionts, they underwent some sort of modifications such that they were able to obtain their energy by undergoing a process called as fermentation. So why did they undergo process of fermentation? Because at that point of time, as I've already said, the atmosphere is a reducing atmosphere. Free molecular oxygen was not available for undergoing aerobic respiration. So they started undergoing an aerobic respiration, which is nothing but fermentation. So through this process of fermentation, they started to obtain their energy, right? They started obtaining their energy, right? Again, in the oceans. So scientists believe that the first life form appeared in the water and those first life forms are referred to as anaerobic heterotrophs. So we know what is anaerobic absence of oxygen and we are also familiar with heterotrophs, right? So these were the first form life forms on the planet Earth. Two important things what you need to remember. First, the first formed life forms on the Earth were actually formed in the water, in the oceans, right? Second one is, second one is, the first formed life forms were formed in the reducing atmosphere. Because at that point of time, as I've already said, free molecular oxygen was not available, right? So the atmosphere was a reducing atmosphere because of which they had to undergo the process of fermentation, right? So this is what is the first group of organisms or first group of living forms which were formed, right? So next one, once anaerobic heterotrophs were formed, the second category of organisms were formed. These were termed as chemoautotrophs, right? They were termed as chemoautotrophs, right? So what are these chemoautotrophs? So what are these chemoautotrophs is? Right. So once anaerobic heterotrophs were formed, right? So once once anaerobic heterotrophs were formed, right? During the course of evolution, some of these anaerobic heterotrophs, right? Some of these anaerobic heterotrophs, right? So they uh, attain the ability of synthesizing organic molecules from inorganic molecules, right? So they started synthesizing organic molecules from inorganic molecules. So they started synthesizing their own organic molecules from the inorganic force. From their inorganic force, right? So what we are seeing here now is the second category of life forms which were formed, which are referred to as chemoautotrophs. Right? So what happened in these chemoautotrophs is some of the anaerobic heterotrophs what we have discussed, right? Some of these anaerobic heterotrophs underwent some sort of modifications, right? They underwent some sort of modifications such that they were able to synthesize organic molecules from inorganic form. So in simple, we can say that they started preparing their own food, right? So they started preparing their own food, right? So during the course of evolution, they attained the ability of preparing their own food from inorganic forms. So therefore, we start calling them as chemoautotrophs. So these were the second category of organisms which were formed. So the first category of organisms formed were termed as anaerobic heterotrophs. The second category of organisms formed were the chemoautotrophs. Now, moving on to the third category of organisms. The third category of organisms are referred to as anoxygenic. Anoxygenic photoautotrophs. Photoautotrophs, right? So they are referred to as N oxygenic photoautotrophs. Now, what are these N oxygenic photoautotrophs? Again, let us get back to the same thing. First form was anaerobic heterotrophs, right? Some of the protobionts they underwent modification and during the course of evolution, they started uh, producing or they started obtaining energy by undergoing a process of fermentation. Right, next one. During the course of evolution, again, some of the anaerobic heterotrophs, some of the anaerobic heterotrophs attain the ability of synthesizing organic molecules from inorganic form. As a result of which, they were able to obtain their energy. Right. The third category is N oxygenic photoautotrophs. Again, 
during the course of evolution, right? During the course of evolution, some of the chemo autotrophs, this time they were able to, or they attained the ability of synthesizing, right? So try to understand this. They attained the ability of synthesizing bacterial chlorophyll. They attained the ability of synthesizing bacterial chlorophyll. From where? From metalloporphyrins. This is an important one. From metalloporphyrins, which was present in the ocean. Right? Metalloporphyrin present in the ocean. Right? Right? So what we are talking about is N oxygenic photoautotrophs. Right? So some of the chemo autotrophs, they attain the ability of synthesizing bacterial chlorophyll from the metalloporphyrin which was present in the ocean. Now, because of the presence of bacterial chlorophyll, right? Because of the presence of bacterial chlorophyll, right? So these organisms they were able to fix carbon dioxide, right? So they were able to fix carbon dioxide, number one, right? And they were able to trap solar energy, right? They were able to fix carbon dioxide and at the same time, they were also able to trap solar energy because of the bacterial chlorophyll which was present, right? Getting it? So let me go through it once again, right? So during the course of evolution, once chemo autotrophs were formed, right? Once chemo autotrophs were formed, during the course of evolution again, some of the chemo autotrophs, they attained the ability of synthesizing bacterial chlorophyll from metalloporphyrins which were present in the ocean. Now, because of the presence of this bacterial chlorophyll, these organisms were able to fix carbon dioxide and at the same time, they were also able to trap solar energy. And one very important thing what you need to remember, even though they were able to fix carbon dioxide, even though they were able to trap solar energy, they were not able to release oxygen into the atmosphere, right? So they were not able to release oxygen, I'm writing it down here. They were not able to release atmosphere, sorry, not able to release oxygen into the atmosphere. Since they were not able to release oxygen into the atmosphere, we started calling them as N-oxygenic. Photo is something to do with light. That is nothing but chlorophyll. Because of the presence of chlorophyll, we are calling them as photo. Autotrophs synthesizing their own food, right? So we started calling them as N-oxygenic photoautotrophs, right? So this is the third category of organisms we have. So three categories we have seen, right, of how life originated on the planet Earth. Right. So once protobionts have been formed, those protobionts now underwent some sort of modifications leading to the formation of life forms, of which the first life form which was formed are a group of organisms called as anaerobic heterotrophs. Right. So some of these protobionts underwent some sort of modifications and during the course of evolution, they were able to obtain their energy by undergoing a process of fermentation. Right. Next one, some of these anaerobic heterotrophs, right, during the course of evolution again, underwent some sort of modification leading to the formation of chemoautotrophs, where they obtained the ability of synthesizing organic molecules from inorganic forms. This is the second category we have. The third category is some of these chemoautotrophs again during the course of evolution, were able to synthesize bacterial chlorophyll from metalloporphyrins in the ocean, right? So they were able to synthesize bacterial chlorophyll from metalloporphyrins, which was present in the ocean. Now, because of this bacterial chlorophyll, they were able to fix carbon dioxide, they were able to trap solar energy, and at the same time, they were not able to release oxygen. Therefore, we, start calling, we started calling them as N-oxygenic photoautotrophs. Right? So these are the three categories what we have. So moving on to the next category, category number four, right? The last category what we have is, right, we leave that here. So the last category what we are going to discuss here is oxygenic photoautotrophs, right? The next one what we have is oxygenic photoautotrophs. So the fourth one here would be oxygenic 
फोटो ऑटो ट्रॉस सो दिस इज द लास्ट कैटेगरी वॉट वी है फोटो ऑटो ट्रॉस राइट सो वंस एन ऑक्सीजनिक फोटो ऑटो ट्रॉस वेर फॉर्म this again led to the formation of oxygenic photoautotrophs now what are these oxygenic photoautotrophs we have seen that an oxygenic photoautotrophs they started synthesizing bacterial chlorophyll from metal of porphyrin that was present in the ocean as a result of which they were able to fix carbon dioxide right as a result of which they were able to fix carbon dioxide and they were able to trap solar energy also but they could not release oxygen into the atmosphere whereas in this category what happened is that is oxygenic photo autotrophs what happened is this bacterial chlorophyll bacterial chlorophyll whatever was there was replaced by true chlorophyll right so what happened here in oxygenic photo autotrophs some of the anoxygenic photo autotrophs again during the course of evolution they underwent modifications in such a way that the bacterial chlorophyll was transformed into true chlorophyll since true chlorophyll was formed this time these organisms right this time these organisms were able to fix carbon dioxide right number one they were able to trap solar energy they were able to trap solar energy and at the same time and at the same time they were also able to release free oxygen into the atmosphere right so they were able to release free oxygen into the atmosphere as a result of which reducing atmosphere reducing atmosphere got transformed into oxidizing atmosphere right reducing atmosphere got transformed into oxidizing atmosphere right so till an oxygenic photoautotrophs the atmosphere was completely a reducing atmosphere because there was no free oxygen available in the atmosphere at that point of time but once oxygenic photoautotrophs were formed right once oxygenic photoautotrophs were formed they were able to since they were able to release oxygen into the atmosphere the reducing atmosphere whatever was there at that point of time got transformed into oxidizing atmosphere so the type of atmosphere what we are seeing now is completely an oxidizing atmosphere and that oxidizing atmosphere is mostly because of the release of oxygen from the oxygenic photoautotrophs till here till then it was completely reducing atmosphere but once oxygenic autotrophs photoautotrophs got evolved at the same time reducing atmosphere got transformed into oxidizing atmosphere so this is important one what you need to remember right so this is what the scientists believe or rather uh, oparin and halden believe how life has originated on the planet earth right so initially they said that it was chemical evolution right chemical evolution followed by the formation of protobionts so once the protobionts have been formed so those protobionts now led to the formation of life on the earth so the first group of organisms the first group of organisms what they have identified is um, anaerobic heterotrophs the second one was chemoautotrophs the third one was anoxygenic photoautotrophs and the fourth one is oxygenic photoautotrophs right so this is how life originated on the planet earth right as given in biological evolution which was proposed by oparin as well as hal right so this is what we have with chemical evolution formation of protobionts and the third one is biological evolution given by oparin and hal so once these proto prokaryotes were formed the prokaryotes now led to the formation of eukaryotes right so once prokaryotes were formed these prokaryotes now led to the formation of eukaryotes so let us quickly see how the eukaryotes were formed right so scientists believe that eukaryotes were formed in two different ways right so they believe that eukaryotes have been formed in two different ways so let us see what are those two different ways in which the eukaryotes were formed so in the first phase what the scientists say is right in the first phase what the scientists say is right we are talking about the first phase in the formation of eukaryotes right so what they say in the first phase is there is this ancestral prokaryote that is being present so this would be the ancestral prokaryote let us consider this as p1 prokaryote one ancestral prokaryote right and then there is one more prokaryote which is prokaryote number 
So this is prokaryote 2. So what the scientists believe is, so this prokaryote 2 entered into prokaryote 1. Right? So this prokaryote, so this, they call it as ancestral prokaryote. Ancestral prokaryote. Right? So this prokaryote, which is P2, entered into ancestral prokaryote. Right? So it entered into ancestral prokaryote. So this is the ancestral prokaryote here, P1. And inside that, there is this P2, another prokaryote which had entered. Now this prokaryote, which is considered as P2 here, during the course of evolution, got evolved into cellular organelles. It got evolved into cellular organelles such as mitochondria, right? Such as mitochondria as well as plastids, leading to the formation of a eukaryote. So this was formed, this structure which was formed was a eukaryote. Now, so this is one way how the scientists believe the eukaryotes would have been formed. So what they say is some of the prokaryotes entered into an ancestral prokaryote, right? As a result of which this prokaryote now got evolved into cellular organelles such as mitochondria as well as plastids. So once mitochondria and plastids were formed, again, it led to the formation of eukaryotes. So this is the first way how the scientists believe the prokaryotes or rather the eukaryotes would have been formed. The second way how the scientists believe is how the eukaryotes would have been formed is the second way how they believe is so there is this prokaryote that is being present. So this prokaryote, the plasma membrane of the prokaryote underwent some sort of invaginations, right? It underwent some sort of invagination. And this invaginations led to the formation of the endomembrane system. Right? It led to the formation of an endomembrane system. So when we say endomembrane system, we have something called as a nuclear membrane. Right? We have the endoplasmic reticulum. We have the Golgi complex. We have the uh, lysosome. We have the vesicle. All those cellular organelles are completely involved in this endomembrane system. So this infolding of the plasma membrane, right? So the infolding of the plasma membrane led to the formation of the endomembrane system as a result of which the eukaryotic organism have been formed. So finally, a eukaryote have been formed. So this is how the scientists believe how the eukaryotes would have been formed. So first, the prokaryotes were formed, right? So from the prokaryotes, the eukaryotes were formed. So this is what the scientists believe. Right? of how prokaryotes and eukaryotes have been formed and how first life forms have been formed. Right? So this is what we have with the topic called as chemical evolution of uh, life, of origin of life, or rather more precisely calling it as the theory of organic evolution proposed by Oparin and Halden. Right? So once Oparin and Halden proposed this particular theory called the theory of chemical origin of life, or theory of organic evolution of life, right? So two scientists, again, started working out on this thing, right? So they performed an experiment, right? So they experimentally wanted to prove, saying that the theory which was given by Oparin and Halden has been completely true, right? So they performed an experiment, right? So they started performing an experiment. So let us start discussing on the experiment which was performed by Oparin and Halden, right? Sorry experiment which was proposed to prove the theory of Oparin and Halle. So we usually start calling this theory as the Urey Miller experiment, right? So we start calling this theory as Urey Miller experiment because it was proposed by two scientists by name Stanley Miller, right? So one scientist is Stanley Miller and the other one is Harold Urey. Harold Urey. So these were the two scientists who came up with the experiment, right, to show that the theory that was proposed by Oparin and Halden is absolutely true, right. So we start calling it as Urey Miller experiment, or we also call it as Miller Urey experiment. So both are the same. So let us see what they did in this particular experiment, right. So Urey and Miller, right, Urey and Miller created the primordial earth, the conditions of the primordial earth in the laboratory. Right? So they created conditions of primordial earth in the laboratory. 
So first, let us take up with the setup, and then we'll see what exactly did they do, right? So the first one, they took a beaker containing water, right? So a beaker was taken containing water. So this beaker was heated, or this water was heated. So this is heated water. where the temperature was said to be very very high it has been constantly being heated right so this started simulating the oceans right that was present in the primordial earth right so this beaker of heated water simulated the oceans that was present in the primordial earth right next they took another beaker right they took this time we can take it as a round bottom flask right so they took a round bottom flask right so they took a round bottom flask so in this round bottom flask they filled this with gases such as ammonia right methane and hydrogen right so they filled this beaker with gases such as ammonia methane and hydrogen so water vapor is also present so we'll see how water vapor came into that and the ratio what they took for this is right it was taken in a ratio of 2 is to 1 is to 1 so this is important what what you need to remember right so two parts of ammonia two parts of methane and one part of hydrogen was taken in this particular chamber so this chamber was named as the spark chamber they call it as spark chamber so in this spark chamber along with gases there were two tungsten electrodes which were fitted right so two tungsten electrodes were fitted in this particular chamber right positive and negative right so this two electrodes it started simulating right they simulated this or they it was simulating lightning right so the same conditions which were seen in the primitive earth or primordial earth were depicted in the laboratory number one heated water body which indicated the oceans right heated water present in the ocean number 2 the gases which were present in the atmosphere right ammonia methane and hydrogen which was present in the uh, atmosphere and then to this spark chamber they connected two tungsten electrodes to simulate the effect of light so whenever electric discharge was given to this particular electrodes it would create a lightning like effect in this particular spark chamber right now these two chambers were interconnected with each other right so they started connecting these two chambers right so these two chambers were interconnected with each other like this right so these two chambers were said to be interconnected with each other right now at the bottom here again at the bottom also they were connected with each other Right, so at the bottom also they were connected with each other. Right, and at the bottom of the spark chamber there was a condenser fixed here. So a condenser was fixed here, so that the process of condensation would occur. So this was a condenser, so that a process of condensation would start occurring here. Right, so a condenser was fixed in this particular place. right a condenser was fixed. this is this is the setup of the ure miller experiment what they did right so complete setup of the ure miller experiment so what they actually meant was right so as and when the water was heated as and when the water was heated water vapor would form and that water vapor would start flowing into this particular chamber and it would finally enter into the spark chamber so water vapor would start entering into the spark chamber as and when the water vapor enters into the spark chamber electric discharge was given with the help of these two electrodes right as a result of that electric discharge what would happen some sort of chemical reaction happened in this particular spark chamber as a result of that chemical reaction several because whatever reactants were formed those reactants were start moving into this and as it moved into the condenser all the gases would start becoming liquids right all the gases would be liquefied and that liquid will now again start moving into this water body again as and when this is continuously keep it boiling right so water vapor again would start entering into this spark chamber 
and when electric discharge was given again some sort of chemical reaction would occur here and at the same time those reactants would pass on into the condenser where they would be liquefied and that liquid would now again get into this particular heated water so this entire process continued for seven days right so they left this setup for almost a week seven days without disturbing right so after seven days after seven days scientists that is ure and miller they started isolating samples from this from the heated water they isolated samples some amount of liquid from here they isolated some amount of liquid from here once they isolated they started to analyze they started analyzing what is present in this particular liquid right so once they analyzed they have observed that certain simple organic molecules were present in this particular liquid when we say simple organic molecules simple organic molecules such as simple amino acids simple amino acids such as glycine right amino acids such as alanine amino acids such as glutamic acid glutamic acid right and along with that some purines and pyrimidines were also present i'm writing it down here some purines as well as pyrimidines were also present in that particular liquid sample what they had analyzed so the same thing was actually told by uh, oparin and halden right in their theory of chemical evolution so what did they say in their theory of chemical evolution they proposed saying that the formation of life on earth is an organic process sorry the formation of life on earth is a chemical process followed by biological process so uh, miller and ure they wanted to prove the chemical process of evolution so they perform this particular set right things what you need to remember this particular heated water body it simulated ocean right it simulated ocean water at that point of time and this part chamber it simulated the atmosphere so we said that the atmosphere consisted of these gases ammonia methane and hydrogen along with that water vapor was also present and the tungsten electrode simulated the lightning which was the one of the physical sources of energy at that point of time right so as per uh, oparin and halden they said that inorganic molecules whatever are there are being transformed into organic forms in the uh, presence of physical factors such as lightning ultraviolet radiation as well as volcanic eruptions so here also the similar thing was depicted here so inorganic components right inorganic components in the presence of physical factor called lightning it led to the formation of organic molecules which was present in the these organic molecules which was present in the heated water right so this now represents the prebiotic soup which was proposed by halden right so the ocean water right this particular water containing those organic molecules it depicts the prebiotic soup or the hot dilute soup which was proposed by halden right so quickly going through it once again right what oparin and halden said and what sandley miller as well as uh, harold ure are trying to explain right so oparin and halden said that in the presence of physical factors such as lightning ultraviolet radiation as well as volcanic eruption whatever organic matter is present that is all the gases that are present in the atmosphere of the primordial earth as a result of those physical factors right led to the formation of simple organic molecules in the ocean so that ocean having or water bodies having the simple organic molecules was referred as a uh, prebiotic soup by hand so once organic molecules were formed those organic molecules led to the formation of protobionts that was coacervates as well as the microspheres once coacervates and microspheres were formed that led to the formation of life on the earth what they call it as biological evolution so we saw about different categories of life which was originated the first one was anaerobic heterotrophs second one was um, chemoautotrophs the third one anoxygenic photoautotrophs and the last one was oxygenic photoautotrophs so from the prokaryotes the eukaryotes were formed 
Right. So once Oparin and Halden gave their theory, right, and as I've already said, right, so this theory of chemical evolution proposed by Oparin and Halden is considered as the uh, most valid theory pertaining to the origin of life. One reason why most of the scientists believe that this is this would have been the way how life originated is because of the experiment performed by Urey and Miller. So what Urey and Miller did was they started depicting the similar conditions which were present at that point of time. Right? They started simulating, right, or they started creating the same conditions which were present in the primordial Earth. One, what did they do? They took a beaker containing heated water, which depicted or which resembled the ocean. Right? Temperature was very high. It resembled the ocean. Right? Second one, what they did was they took the gases, right, which was present in the atmosphere at that point of time. Gases such as ammonia, methane, and hydrogen in the ratio 2 is to 2 is to 1. Right? And tungsten electrodes, it resembled the lightning effect at that point of time. Right? And they fixed a condenser here. Right? So that whatever reactants were formed or the gases would be converted into liquid. So they left this entire setup for one week. Right? So in this one week, what would happen is, since the water was boiling here, that boiled water would be transformed into water vapor and it would go into the spark chamber. In the spark chamber, when electric discharge was given, at that point of time, some sort of chemical reaction would occur in the spark chamber. As a result of which, the resultant gases would pass on into this particular condenser. As it would pass into this condenser, the gases, whatever are there, would be liquefied, and that liquefied substance or the reactants would now enter into this particular heated water, and this entire process would continue for seven long days. Right. So after a period of seven days, Urey and Miller started isolating the sample from here, from the water bodies, right? and they started analyzing this water. And as a result of that analysis, what they observed was the water bodies contained glycine, alanine, glutamic acid, simple amino acids, and along with that, it also contained purines and pyrimidines, showing that, showing that this was the conditions of the primordial earth, Right? And during those particular conditions, it led to the for inorganic molecules, led to the formation of organic molecules. Right? So this, through this experiment, they proved that whatever uh, theory which was given by Oparin and Halden were exactly similar to their experimental setup. So they proved that the theory of Oparin and Halden, which is the theory of chemical evolution, is a valid theory. And this is one of the reasons why most of the scientists believe that this is the best theory what can, which could be accepted with regards to the origin of life on the earth. Right? So this is what we have with the origin of life on the earth. Right? So once life originated on the earth, that life now led to the formation of or rather evolution of different species. Right? One more very important thing what you need to remember here is right? in present day, origin of life does not occur. Why origin of life does not occur in the present day? The major reason for that is now what we are living is an oxidizing atmosphere. So for origin of life, reducing atmosphere is required. Since we don't have reducing atmosphere now, origination of life is not possible now, but rather evolution is taking place. Right? So we'll stop here for today and in the next session, we'll take up with the topic called as evolution. Right? So how different organisms have been evolved from these life forms which have been originated almost 4 billion years ago. Right?